Just by way of brief introduction, uh, Sharice Maynard uh, is the founder and CEO of Envision Care Strategies and a contributing writer for Healthcare Analytics News Magazine. Uh, Sharice is focused on healthcare policy development and implementation, tech-driven care delivery, and fostering improved patient-provider communications. Argentina Moyes is the founder and CEO of Bleaksy, a decentralized blockchain-based e-commerce platform. She is a serial entrepreneur with both a math and IT background and 15 years of e-commerce experience. John Palmasano is our resident energy expert on the panel, having advised companies, governments, and NGOs on trading-based energy policies. And he's recently been developing a blockchain application for supply chain management and energy trading. Desiree Dickerson is uh, currently researching how distributed ledger technology can empower women in post-conflict marginalized countries with Women for Women International. Uh, she writes for 21 Cryptos, a cryptocurrency trading magazine, and she edits Whale Reports. She also consults with a DC-based venture capital firm on all things blockchain. Did I, did I miss anything there? Uh, Lisa Gus is rounding out our panel. She is the founder and CEO of Wish Nish. Kanish? Kanish? Wish Kanish, a blockchain based platform for, gamified, uh, for building gamified social marketplace communities. Uh, among other things, she is also the managing director of Curiosity Quills Press, and I love that name. Uh, so I was hoping that we could start uh, before we get down into the weeds um, with a more general discussion about. Uh, blockchain generally. Um, the word blockchain gets thrown around a lot. I've already used it a few times. Um, but I think it's useful to drill down a bit to make sure that we're all talking about the same thing here. Um, so I, I put it to, the, uh, to anyone out there who wants to tackle this one to just give the, the audience a brief description of what a blockchain is, uh, whether or the distinction between a blockchain, a decentralized ledger, whether one is a form of the other, uh, and just to talk about a bit of the nuts and bolts before we dig in here. Um, blockchain is actually a um, ledger. What makes it um, unique, the way the uses we're using now, is because it's a distributed ledger. So the easiest way, and I'm in the healthcare game, so I always try to describe it as not the Batman, but the Robin of the scene because most people think blockchain is this new thing that everybody's trying, this new shiny thing, I guess is what we'll say. But it is a distributed ledger and um, the uses we're seeing for it now, people are looking at it as the new shiny thing, but what it is is an enhancement to um, security and different measures and integrations. And I think the best way for people to approach it if they don't understand it is to find how it fits into the way they need to use it. Not to everybody try to jump on the bandwagon and say, oh, we're doing this in blockchain, we're doing that in blockchain, because blockchain is not the solution, is a part of the solution. So, so what, what is the blockchain, and how are, how are blocks added to the chain? Yeah. Go for it, Trace. OK, these are. Um, um, distributed um, networks, and you usually have persons who are groups of networks who are on the um, block. So everybody gets their own ledger. It contains the same information. You're sharing data. So anything of value that you're sharing on the block, it can be data, it can be um, currency and that type of thing. It is not Bitcoin. So everybody <laughs> who thinks that um, blockchain is Bitcoin, Bitcoin is built on a blockchain, not the other way around. Um, so everybody gets their own copy of the ledger, and the, um, what's unique about it is that it's all um, updated in real time. So um, let me give you a simple use, credentialing. Let's say um, you have a patient um, who wants to get a um, prescription filled, and a question I get all, uh, often is, why does it take so long for me to get a prescription? And I always say, you think you're the only person involved in that transaction between you and your doctor or you and your pharmacist, but there's really actually 10 people in that room. So what they're doing is there's so many transactional inefficiencies. Everybody's getting credentialing done. Everybody's making sure that you're authorized to have that um, medication. It's a lot involved in that process. What blockchain does is give everybody involved in that process their own copy of the ledger. And it allows them to credential everybody in real time 
exchange data in real time, secure it all in real time, and make it so others can access it without everybody in that circle being informed about it. And it'll get your prescription to you in a matter of hours as, as opposed to, I mean, a matter of minutes as opposed to a matter of hours. So, so essentially what we're saying is that once all the, the parties verify the information at hand, then a block is added to the chain? Exactly. Okay. So is, for, for our purposes here, I mean, should we take a step back and talk about decentralized ledger technology generally? Is, is that really the technology that underpins a lot of these tech, uh, the, you know, applications that we're seeing right now? Lisa? Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, as she has mentioned, really what it is, is just having a ledger that everyone has. And once every, that is a consensus each, then that's the copy that everyone can now have and want that it's considered the truth. It's considered the real thing which everyone has to follow and obey. But actually, at the same time, while it could be dangerous, because, you know, what if there is a man in the middle attack? What if there is someone coming in and bringing in the wrong information? What then? I mean, is it going to destroy the entire chain? But that's where having a distributed ledger comes in. If the chain is big enough, or if it's secured enough in case of a private mass chain, then what it means is the information that flows in needs to be needs to be agreed upon by enough computers, by enough nodes, that it's really difficult to um, reach at the same time. And that's why the distributed nature of it makes it so secure at the same time as some people could see that it's really opening up to um, people coming in and abusing it. It can't. If enough people are involved, that's really what makes it so secure. Thank you. The, the, this next one's for John. Uh, for, for many of us, uh, myself included, I, I, blockchain technology is still largely abstract and that we really haven't seen or, I, or maybe realized that we've seen applications in, in the marketplace. Um, can you maybe highlight some of the applications that are in use today? Um, you know, I'm thinking maybe food supply chain uh, in the energy space for you in particular. Well, I'll give a couple of thoughts about that. <clears throat> but first, I just would like to comment on the last sure. discussion. It, it, it's almost Talmudic to talk about what is the essence of blockchain and distributed ledger. In my world, the customer, the client, the entity that's trading, the entity that is investing in me and my ideas, they really don't care. Form follows function. What is it that I'm trying to achieve? And if blockchain is part of the solution, God bless America, let's go with blockchain. But if blockchain is just a substitute for, for Excel or SQL or something like that, then I'm wasting my time because these legacy systems work. They're working all around us. So, you know, that's my only observation about some of the things we're, that were just discussed. I, I don't find it fruitful. In terms of use cases, there's so many use cases. I, I, I only know about energy and environment. Um, so in the environmental area, for example, there's a huge problem with deforestation associated with uh, palm oil. That's a very big problem, not here in Arlington, but in lots and lots of countries. So you're able to track, you can track the palm oil from the tree, from the tree to the grower, to the GPS, to the truck that picks it up, the guy's ID, the, the time he picked it up, he brought it to the next station, it was aggregated, did it, did it, did it, all the way to Nestle. And now I got a candy bar from Nestle, and it's got a, let's say, 56 digit code on it. And I could find out what tree it came from, was there deforestation associated with it? Likewise with gender inequality. That's a big issue to a lot of people, it is to me. What about slavery associated with fish farming in, in Southeast Asia? What about, we could go on and on and on. So that whole supply chain in terms of environmental social benefits is really important to track. My, let's say my interest and people like me, that interest is what happens at the end of that supply chain? There's a transaction. Ah, money gets exchanged. What a perfect application for blockchain because I know the characteristics of the cocoa, the palm oil, the copper, the 
the emissions credit that came from what country, where, how. That's a really wonderful kind of thing. So it <coughs> provides a big social benefit, like Excel provided a big benefit to users. It also provides a pecuniary benefit to people like me who are in it for the money. And I can, I can wipe out intermediaries. And there are thousands and thousands of intermediaries who should be wiped out because they're taking usurious advantage of people at the ground level in the cocoa coffee business, et cetera. Uh, does anyone else want to weigh in on some yeah. of the applications? Uh, I'd like to go back a little bit to uh, blockchain and distributed sure. ledgers. There is a difference. When you are talking about blockchain, the information is distributed across all the nodes. When you are talking about uh, permission or permissionless distributed ledgers, information is not uh, spread across all nodes. It's, uh, it belongs just to the nodes that needs to know what is uh, inside the small network that goes there. So for most of the businesses, there is no need to put a lot of information in the blockchain. Everything can stay in a distributed ledger. It's very expensive to store information in the blockchain these days. And what we recommend is always to put just the hashes. And this will create references to distributed <coughs> databases that can be either centralized or decentralized. It doesn't really matter. When it comes to the supply chain, uh, when you look for the provenance, there is no, not always uh, true what you write in the blockchain. Uh, anybody can say anything when uh, they try to prove uh, the provenance of diamonds. It depends when it starts. And if you are able to embed some type of sensors to prove that the product originated where you saved that location in the blockchain. So it's not always a benefit using the blockchain. But I would agree with you, but I'd always say it's garbage in, garbage out. So if there's junk that comes in at the genesis point or the very beginning point, then it's going to be junk all the way absolutely through. So whether it's supply chain or any kind of transaction, you've got to start, well, I'm agreeing with, with, with you. Uh, what we see in these days, uh, luxury companies, they are use, using identifiers to prove authenticity and uh, to identify uh, counterfeit products that are coming into the marketplace. That's the only way you can prove provenance and authenticity. It's not necessarily the blockchain in the end. The blockchain is not a vehicle. It, it is, but it's not an authority in that sense. And see, healthcare is different because we don't um, operate in that way. We can't just, you know, um, prove it by calling somewhere and that type of thing. Everything has to be credentialed. Everything has to be verified. Everything has to be peer reviewed. Um, and everything at the end of the day is contributing to someone's health outcome. So um, the blockchain, and it's no secret that in healthcare, security and breaches are huge. Um, you know, I have companies will say that we're not interested in blockchain technology um, because we believe our system can't be hacked. To which I'll say, hold my coffee, let me show you how your system can be hacked. Um, and usually, you know, you can get them to understand healthcare is different. We have um, HIP, HIPAA to consider. Um, and like I said, at the end of the day, in healthcare, what you're doing is improving outcomes. And you want to be able to um, use the um, um, integrations with blockchain to um, secure people's health data but also to improve how they interact with their doctors, how um, communication is done, how quick they get medicines, how quick they get access to care. Um, so verification and credentialing, it all is on a deeper level and again, HIPAA. So um, blockchain, the uses that we're um, seeing emerge in, in healthcare are not only um, pivotal, but they're extremely important. Did you talk about a few of them? Yes. <laughs> um, in healthcare, you get a lot of uh, um, companies and vendors who say, and they call me all the time, in HIMSS, they will pull me in the aisle, oh, you're Twitter famous, we need you to look at our product and get it out there. And I'm like, 
I will look at them, and they don't have a use case um, ready for market, which is very important in healthcare because there's this need right now. Um, but we are seeing some actual um, movement and some, I don't like to use the word promising because the next vendor that tells me something's promising, I'm really going to scream. But um, <laughs> the, um, the companies or vendors where we're actually seeing use cases now um, and where they're raising money and actually have a product ready to go to the market. My favorite one right now, they just invited me down to Atlanta um, to spend a whole day to see how theirs is working and that type of thing is um, Patientory. They're um, doing it and it, the reason why I really like their product is because it gives more um, patients more control of their own data. Um, where I'm not seeing with them is um, that I'm working with the, like the state exchanges and that type of thing, but they're very um, early, but they do have a use case. They say that they're ready for me to see. And then um, Mediblack has um, actual one, the same thing, patient communication. Um, and then for credentialing, the only company right now who's doing it, who actually has a case in, as I say, the contracts are signed, um, so they have contracts with the different states or for credentialing of um, health care providers um, is um, Hashed Health. Um, and they invited me to come see their unit at um, HIMSS um, recently. Um, I was in to see that and um, I like what they're doing. I didn't think they were quite ready, but now um, I actually talked to them yesterday and they said we're ready. So. Um, those are the most promising ones I see. Everybody else is like, they're all, it, it promises to do this. It's emerging technology. And, we can, and what I find is that a lot of these organizations just want to um, rush to get blockchain something going because it's the new shiny thing. But what's missing is they don't understand who they are. And I always ask them the same thing when we're talking about um, blockchain and healthcare because we're dealing with people's lives. I always say, what's the job? Healthcare itself is supposed to be disruptive in nature as we define it now. So I always, my first question to them is always, what the job, what's the job you're um, doing? I don't want you to tell me what you think your product's going to do in 10 years from now. I want you to tell me what's the job you're performing for patients, doctors, systems, states, and that type of thing. And if they can't answer that, I always tell them, you're not ready. <laughs> Uh, the, the next one's for Desiree. Have, have you seen uh, governments or legislators um, express a willingness to adopt, or at the very least, not an unwillingness uh, to adopt blockchain or similar technologies, um, even if not explicitly in, in these named industries? Thinking maybe about humanitarian efforts, things like that. Yeah, so um, GSA, the Government Services Administration, is undertaking a lot of efforts towards emerging technologies and um, Justin Herman is actually heading up that effort and they're actually putting out blockchain contracts um, somewhat regularly. So uh, the government's definitely taking that seriously. I think the Department of State, um, I know that they have a public-private partnership with Coca-Cola um, where they're doing some um, supply chain around migrant workers. Um, hmm at the next World Cup. So um, in terms of like the federal government, they're doing a lot. I mean, I know, I believe it was the state of Colorado or the city of Denver um, is launching some type of um, program to teach veterans um, how to work on blockchain as it relates to cybersecurity, um, wherever that intersection happens. Um, so I mean, there's a lot being done, and I mean, I think the regulatory um, legal aspect has been in the news quite a bit with um, kind of the issues with how the CFTC, FinCEN, um, and the SEC really um, regulate in terms of the cryptocurrency, which I will wholeheartedly back that you can't have one without the other um, unless you're on a permission blockchain, which is also has its issues. It's, susceptible to 51% attacks and whatnot. So I, mean, I think you know, going back to the building blocks, it's something else to look at is permission versus a public blockchain, which are, have, both have their pros and cons, but are um, very distinct. Well, let's, let's, let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, yeah. um, Lisa, uh, would you maybe want to talk about the difference between a public and a private, or a permission and a, a public blockchain, and how maybe a permission blockchain is distinct, if at all, from what might be out there in the market already? 
Yeah, sure. But actually, can I go back to the previous question for a minute? Sure. I am at your mercy. <laughs> well, the reason I'm actually doing that is because I can speak to some of that initiatives that are going on outside of the U.S. And in fact, one of the reasons I'm so late to this event is because we were up in the middle of the night speaking to Kenya. And um, they have just started a task force really towards creating a framework for how to treat blockchain technology and how to differentiate it from cryptocurrencies. And I tell you what, it's so amazing to see that them, them taking the initiative and kind of coming out ahead of the pack compared to the US, for example, where we here just jumped in, started doing it, and then just now kind of decided to go back and decide what exactly we are doing here. And they are really putting the horse before the cart in this case. So that's really kind of really nice to see. And prior to that, we are also in touch with the Indian government, uh, their federal department of innovation. And they're also currently um, putting together a framework for how to deal with the technologies. Now in their case, they're really, really deeply against speculating on cryptocurrencies. And one of the reasons there is uh, they want to prevent it being used in terms of dark money, black money um, floating into the market uh, through the Bitcoin speculation and ICOs. So really what they're creating is a framework for tokenization to work and how to permit companies such as ours and really anyone who wants to use blockchain technology and tokenize both auctions and products um, into not really running afoul of the regulation. Because really it's a huge deal into, they want to create a closed system that they get to control, but at the same time allow freedom for co companies to experiment and really bring in the innovation. So I think that's something that um, I would love to see U.S. undertake um, on a deeper scale. We've been in touch with the Department of Commerce here in the U.S. and it's much, much slower going, um, even though obviously India is much bigger on a scale of things. I mean, we have 300 million people in the U.S., they have a million, a billion 300. And yet, they are so far ahead of us in really defining what it is, you know, we need to, the frameworks really in, in place. That's, that's something that um, I think that's really only going to come into play here, maybe in 2019, if not later than that. So that's just kind of my experience anyway. But um, having hugged the mic, I'm happy to answer to the permission chains or maybe Argentina can start because I know it's a huge yes. thing for her. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, uh, what I realized in the last six months is that real businesses in government, they always care about data privacy and security. So they, will not, they are not ready to choose private blockchains or, private distrib uh, or uh, public distributed ledgers. They will always uh, go for the permission distributed ledgers uh, when they can uh, decide who are the actors inside the network. They need to know their identities. Nobody is willing to share all their customers or sale data with all the market participants. That's why we will see in the near future most of the businesses adopting a permission distributed ledger or a private blockchain. It's the only way to conduct business and collaborate without sharing too much information. But so, so how is that different then what might, or I, I guess I should frame the question as uh, if, what happens if the permissioned uh, party is hacked? Uh, uh, does that end up in the same place as wh where we are with a non-blockchain company? And uh, no. Uh, in a non-blockchain company, information is centralized. So it's a central authority, and once you hack, you hack everything. When it comes to a permission distributed ledger network, there are just few nodes that can be hacked. The network itself stays safe. So everyone is in charge of their own security. So that will ensure highest levels of data privacy and security in the end. Desiree, it looks like you want to Yeah, no, unless there's like a botnet attack, which in that case, the entire network would be become a centralized party and therefore everything, you know, you have that access. Have we seen uh, security breaches like that for 
you know, companies mm. with permission blockchain? No, I mean, theoretically, it's possible. I mean, you would probably need some sort of quantum computing, um, but um, no, I mean, it, most of the hacking that happens around the blockchain is like third party applications. I, I, I think the jury's still out on this issue. First of all, what is the nature of the hack? Did someone find out that my daughter's name is Samantha, or did somebody take 5,000 bitcoins out of my wallet? So there's a big difference. Uh, second, uh, it depends on the application that you're looking at. So I look at commercial transactions. People who trade oil, gas, electricity, emissions credits, what have you, they write big tickets. And they're very concerned about liability. So before you could even get somebody onto your system, the risk committee at Goldman or Accenture or somewhere, who are Swiss Re, they want to review your system and they want to know who stands behind it. Who's standing behind? Who's writing insurance? Who's doing DNO insurance or hackability insurance or some kind of insurance and they're providing, let's say, $50 million guarantee against X, Y, and Z. I haven't run into that yet. But that's the next frontier. If you want to get into the commercial world, I'm not talking about retail, you know, $100, $500 transaction, but multi-million dollar transactions. Uh, you, you need an entity. Eventually, you got to get to some entity that's standing behind you. Uh, I agree, I'm sold on blockchain, hook, line, and sinker. So I'm a believer, I drank the Kool-Aid. But it, to roll out a commercial grade system for big, tickets with big players, um, this issue of liability, I believe, is yet to be resolved and it's going to be a retirement program for smart attorneys. <laughs> I, I was going to add something there, but I'll hold off. Uh, it seems like a pretty good time to w w segue into smart contracts. We talked a little bit about them before, but uh, John, I know that this is something that uh, you've written upon. Um, can we just get a general overview of a smart contract and then maybe uh, how they're applied in the context of a blockchain network? Maybe somebody else would like to comment on that. I'll, I'll just say quickly how a smart contract would work. Uh, again, again, in the commercial world, um, uh, so imagine you have an oracle like the Dow Jones Industrials. So there, I write a contract, Argentina and I write, write a contract um, I promise to sell my house to you for $50 if the Dow Jones Industrials drop more than 500 points in the next 24 hours. It's time stamped, it's this, that, and the other, and the Oracle is the Dow Jones Industrial feed that's coming in every couple of seconds. Of course, somebody's put up some escrow and a letter of credit, which is being held, it's being held someplace. All this is electronic. And if nothing, ha if nothing happens, nothing happens. But if the Dow Jones Industrials drop by that certain point and we pick up that fee, there's, an ex there's a very, very rapid exchange, which depending on this block cycle could be completed in, in, in just a few minutes. What does that do to the brokerage community? That wipes out the brokerage community. So if, you're, if you care about things on a micro scale, invest in my company. If you care about things at a macro scale, if you could short the brokerage community, if there are 500,000 people in America who are brokers or intermediaries today, if you could short that, I'd bet just about everything I have that in five years, there won't be 500,000 people. There'll be a heck of a lot less. And that could be a smart contract where somebody could take out a hedge on their own profession. I, I, I think that, uh, Sharice, you could probably speak uh, best to the question of, inter of intermediaries and taking them out of the equation, at least in the healthcare field. I mean, does, do we think that that poses any problems, uh, any confidentiality risks, things like that? Well, um, it poses problems for a lot of stakeholders. Um, because everybody in, like I said, all these people who are in the room when you're seeing your doctor, everybody has their own interest there. So it poses a threat in that um, those people who have so much control in that room have less control um, in this um, situation that we're talking about. So for the patient, for the, for the provider, for the society as a whole, it's a wonderful thing. So if you look at even something like um, direct primary care, where 
you're removing that middleman altogether. Insurance company is out of that equation. You have the patient there and the doctor. The payments are paid to that practice directly, um, and the information is shared on that blockchain. All, only those entities in that what we call the circle of care have access to that information. It cannot be changed without those people agreeing for it to be changed. It recognizes the patient as the owner of that data. That's a wonderful world, ideally. However, the insurance industry would have a great problem with us recognizing direct primary care as an insurance model because it cuts them out. So that CEO of United Healthcare, who currently makes $79,000 per hour, where the average um, American makes maybe 20, I don't know, $20 an hour, um, uh, it all of a sudden takes all that money out of their pocket. So yeah, it causes problems for um, several interests, but it's the greater good for the masses. Argentina, go for it. In retail, it's a little bit different because uh, there is no regulation, so uh, we, we don't need permission to remove intermediaries like uh, centralized marketplaces like Amazon and uh, Walmart. Uh, we can trust uh, the network without the need to trust each other. Exactly. So yeah. uh, the smart contract itself, it's an agreement between two parties that will self-execute uh, without the need of an intermediary, once certain conditions are met. So it simplifies the entire process. Elisa, uh, can you talk a bit about how a smart contract like, interacts with, uh, with blockchain on a retail level? Like if, if you're selling me a product, like how, just nuts and bolts, how, how does that work? Well, in our case, it really, as Argentina said, quite simple. Um, if you know, if I want to sell something, then I can just put up the price, and as soon as it's met, then immediately the product completely and fully and equally belongs to whoever has paid the price. Now, um, we can actually make it, we can start talking about ZRM technology because right now we are working, for example, with a big uh, publishing distributor, and there is no way they would allow um, the books, for example, to not have a ZRM. So in that case, we would need to make sure that those conditions are met. And that would also need to be written into the smart contract in terms of making sure that you cannot, in that case, resell the book, for example, or you cannot open it uh, un under certain conditions. So then, in that case, what you need is a Turing complete contract, uh, which is something that has been pioneered by Ethereum, as opposed to something like an IOTA, which actually is very simple. If then if this, then that. That would be um, your Turing incomplete contract. Now, what the Turing complete contract is, it's something that allows the data to be stored right within the contract, and that actually allows the changes within the blockchain under certain conditions. So th in that case, obviously, when it starts, when more than one party is involved, then in that case, you need to really program a lot more of different developments in, like for example, the development uh, with the example with the Dow Jones. So that would really depend on how many parties participate and what conditions need to be met. So, so are you guys, gals really, uh, seeing um, an increase in the importance of coders and developers and maybe a decrease import in importance of attorneys in terms of drafting contracts for your enterprises? I would actually say no, maybe eventually yes, uh, once every nuts and bolts in the uh, legal sense are actually taken care of. But initially I wouldn't want to write a contract myself, so I would need the help of an attorney to write it and then I would need a coder to actually put it into a code. Now eventually once everything is really simplified to nuts and bolts basically, then perhaps you might need have less need of an attorney for that for those cases, but at the same time, I think more um, use cases will arise, which you actually cannot even imagine right now. So less billable hours. That's what we're saying. <laughs> <laughs> yes, for now. I think right. for now. It's yeah. not just that. <laughs> if fun. you reach a certain level of standardization, you don't need any. You don't need developers. You don't need lawyers. But they'll be creative to come up with. Well, yeah, that's true. But problems. I mean, Exactly, so, well, I think that humans are a kind of 
um, animal that's going to come up with its own set of problems, and then I think you're still going to need lawyers to figure out what to do with the programs, and then coders to put it in to a smart contract. Uh, this this next one is for uh, is for Desiree. Um, you know, it uh, it, it it seems uh, that. Um, that uh, more firmly entrenched industries and players in those industries might have a harder time uh, pivoting to blockchain solutions. Um, ha have you seen, uh, and, and I think you, you noted a couple, I think Lisa noted a couple earlier, um, examples of maybe uh, entities in the developing world or uh, more nascent industries uh, being quicker to adopt blockchain and related technologies? Um, I definitely agree with Lisa. I mean, I think the barrier to entry in terms of implementing these solutions is much lower in developing countries because there's not a whole set of bureaucratic nightmares to overcome. But then you see um, use cases like IBM with um, Walmart and s food supply chain. So, um, you know, I, I think those type of partnerships are really pushing it forward in, in, in bigger industries. Um, but then again, I mean, I think it's not ever very often mentioned to realize that the technology is so still so nascent and the user friendliness is so low um, that a lot of industries aren't giving the technology time to develop while also um, internally preparing for how to on-ramp on this technology in the future. So I think for like an amazing use case that I'm obsessed with is electronic healthcare records, especially when it comes to interoperability between v VA and DOD. And I, I think that's just ripe for innovation. But um, that being said, I, there's, you know, 800 policies at VA that, that would need to clear through. And then, then you're bringing in in terms of any industry, um, the GDPR regulations coming out of Europe and, sure. and how to deal with that. I mean, there's so much going on that I mean, I think on both ends, you're seeing these big institutional players um, leading the way, um, but then you're also seeing a lot of innovation happening at the ground level. So I think at some point, once we get enough time, um, both, um, both of those sectors will, will kind of meet. I think you're maybe applying the wrong model here. Um, in the developed world, we have all these legacy systems, and the reason we have the legacy systems, they work, okay? So we all know that the status quo is a competitor against any new idea, and the people who've invested in those legacy systems don't roll over and play dead and go to their boss and say, gee, boss, we got 50 million sunk into this archaic central processing system, we, we, we just quit and we're going blockchain. No way. That doesn't happen. But the virgin territory is in the developing world where there's a huge population, no legacy system, where we've got examples of M-Pesa in, 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 in Kenya, where the you know, electronic transfer of, of funds, um, it's easier. It's more receptive. The, what do we learn? The, the, the competition between a Ptolemaic and Copernican world is a long drown a big battle between the Copernicans finally win and Galileo dies and it's the end of the story. But in the, in the emerging world, and let's look at the emerging world, I guess we've all heard about China, India, more English-speaking engineers in India than the United States, smart people, hardworking people. They're, there's nothing, there's no barrier, a legacy system barrier. Furthermore, in India, moving toward electronic commerce, doing away with you know, hard currency, lays the groundwork for a billion people to jump on to a cell phone based blockchain universe while we're sitting here still talking about it. They're moving at warp speed. And that's just the nature of technology. I just wanted to um, touch on the um, VA. The VA is actively pursuing um, blockchain uses, and in fact, um, um, recently, strangely enough, Jared Kushner um, was at a meeting um, with me, and they are trying to make it so any um, entity who treats a, um, a veteran in that system agrees to the interoperability rules and to use some of these technologies in those rules. Huh. And now, starting, I think it's um, really recent, they just announced it yesterday, the day before, 
each patient who leaves the VA leaves there with an electronic medical record of their own. So all these things wouldn't be possible if we weren't moving towards some of these technologies. And before, we know the VA's been a mess. Um, you know, there's no two ways about that. What it lacks right now is just leadership. So some of these things that they're trying to put in um, place and that type of thing are actually working. They're changing, they're taking away some of those stringent regulations, which is a good thing because it will help, particularly with um, blockchain applications, it will help um, veterans get care quicker. Um, like I said, the credentialing will be real time um, and it will allow them to have access to those records and not only them, the other entities that treat them within those systems real time. So it'll speed everything up. So they are um, doing that now. I guess they can cancel that sole source contract with DOD. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but I believe Hopefully. identity management is the first yeah. uh, benefit for blockchain technology. It will reach the fastest adoption in undeveloped countries. There are billions of people with no identity, and they are working. The World Bank and there are uh, many non-profit organizations that are putting all these people in blockchain to give them an identity, and also. Through this identity, they are able to prove ownership uh, in their countries. So it will be harder in the future for their governments to take away what is already in the blockchain. Lisa, I think you were going to jump in. Well, I wanted to jump in, but then um, actually. But your thunder was stolen. I, my thunder was stolen, but I have to agree. Um, it's much, much simpler to get adoption of a new technology in emerging countries. Um, they have less to lose. And just as I was sitting here, I was thinking of a story that I read way back as a kid. It was a, a science fiction, but it kind of really resonates with me now, especially uh, when Cherise has spoken about a CEO um, losing $79,000 an hour. Well, yeah, that's great, and I'm sure rivers of tears are going to be cried over it. However, all the people that are working under that CEO are also going to lose the money and uh, because they're not going to be needed anymore. And I think part of it, of something that we need to do is uh, to facilitate the blockchain adoption is to really think of ways uh, to make those people useful. Like, for example, when it comes to realty, when it comes to, you brought up uh, lawyers, for example, there needs to be there need to be jobs for the people that um, are losing them due to what we're coming in with. And just recently, Elon Musk has spoken that too much automation too soon in the workplace that's going to result in a loss of jobs. So while I'm sitting here and speaking up for the blockchain technology, I think we really need to think about how we can ease the strain in the developed countries where those incomes are definitely important. That's a that is an uplifting and uh, important message that I think we might end this portion on, uh, and I'll open it up to the audience if anyone has any questions. And if none, I will throw the first one out there. Um, this is for everyone down the line. Um, what important new trend are we gonna be talking about next year on this panel? John, go for it. <laughs> to me, there's only one. It's, uh, the integration, of, the integration of AI and blockchain. Mm -hmm. That integration in the commercial world and I believe in the retail data, data mining world is going to be absolutely overwhelming. It'll be like two tsunamis hitting you. And, 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 and nobody knows where it's going to come from, but when it, when it comes, it's going to be like make whoever's behind it, Mark Zuckerberg's going to look like a pauper because there's so much money that's at stake worldwide AI blockchain integration. I wish I could figure it out, but somebody will. Have you heard any ideas about this? I, I'm, I'm curious if you have anything else to add because I'm, my interest is peaked, but I have nothing, I have no image in my head. Well, just, just imagine, just imagine you've got a trading system, smart contract trading system, and you're able to track all the back and forth. I bid five, somebody comes back seven, now it ventures you agree on five, 550, okay? That data is gonna be captured both in the blockchain and potentially somewhere else. You don't have to, re you'll never know the names of the parties involved. They'll just be a hashed thing, you know, nobody will know. But if you capture enough of that and you run it through some neural networks or other AI or Watson or whatever the hell you, you've got, you'll be able to figure out all kind of brilliant trading strategies. In fact, I would bet in the next couple of years, 
You'll be able to design your own hedge. You'll be able to say, I have a risk. My house value could go down 20% in the next five years. Could Zillow create some kind of hedge for me based on transactions? I mean, that's just one very simple kind of idea. But if you've got all that traffic shooting through you, pseudo-anonymously, okay, still you're running it through a bunch of smart systems, you'll be able to customize contracts, you'll be able to hedge, you'll be able to sell that data in various ways. Even pseudo-anonymously, it'll be hugely valuable to, to Watson or son of Watson. Lisa? I kind of at least, I'm not sure if it's going to be the new trend next year, but it's something that's going to pop up. And I think there are two things, uh, taxation within the blockchain, because again, to allow adoption, we need to give government its cut. So I think that really needs to be a lot further discussed and in fact made part of a smart contracts going forward, especially for us as it's we're part of the retail. And the other part is um, the way to transfer ownership of an account. Like let's say right now, a lot of cryptocurrency owners are fairly young but they're going to age and they will want to start thinking of actually legal representation and the way to give that rights to the kids. So how do you get an oracle that would work within that system? Yeah, so, so for instance, uh, I own however many Bitcoin and what happens when I die? Are we gonna write it into my will? Is it even possible to transfer the exactly. wallet? Things like that. And how do you actually pre prevent it from being gamed and actually announcing someone being dead and then immediately transferring those bitcoins and then hey next thing someone is saying hey i'm still alive what happens to the bitcoins that's we have a couple you want a technical question about this distributed ledger is distributed in the sense that there are many copies of the same ledger mm -hmm. and the different actors have uh, have uh, access each one to its own copy. Yes. Yes. And then the copies are re-updated uh, when I write something in my ledger and communicate with all the other ones. Mm -hmm. Or is one only one central ledger that every, mm -hmm. no, okay. everybody gets their own copy right. if so it's that updated. There are a million people that are participants. You have a million copies of the same ledger. No. Yeah. Yes and no. Depends. <laughs> if you have a public blockchain, you have a copy everywhere. If you have a, a private one, just the parts that need to know that information have that information. There is no need for other parties to store that type of information. It's useless to them and costly. Okay. So the, the problem with the energy with the the the, air, the blockchain spends so much energy. Or the does it come from this duplicity of the... Where, where does this come from? Uh, it's, it comes because uh, that's the way it was set up the Bitcoin blockchain. Everything will be stored in the Bitcoin blockchain. That means it's getting extremely expensive because storage is getting expensive. And how big... Uh, each, it's a copy on each computer. Uh, what type of storage you have? So the bigger the database, the more expensive will be to store information in that blockchain. So in the future, we need to optimize and write as little as possible in this public blockchain. So it will be cheaper and they will hold more information. So just hashes that will point back into distributed databases that can be either centralized or decentralized. It doesn't matter. Yes, going down there. So, a comment and question. Talk about the integration of AI and blockchain and quantum computers. Where this ends up is Skynet. We've already seen this. Okay. Um, but, the, but the question is um, technology always leads society by a little bit, pulls it along. You're talking about having, knowing where my you know, Hershey bar, which tree it came from, which truck was on. This is sort of like going to the end of the line, collecting far more information than most people even want to need. Well, some people want it. How do you know, you know how much information is enough in collecting and generating all these, all these ledgers and collecting all this information? Well, if, if you look at me, it depends on your application how much 
information is enough. So if, if it's in the medical world, if this should ever come to pass, I would want all my stuff there, but I wouldn't want my keys to protect it, and I would only share it with my practitioner, and maybe I would only share it for one day, 48 hours, or something like that, and it would automatically self-destruct, or certainly in certain fields. But in, in, in my commercial world, maybe there's only five fields that I care about. You know, the, the name, Swift code, bank code, and how much escrow, blah, blah, blah. And once the transaction is done, I, I, it's all wiped out. I really, don't, I really don't care other than for tax purposes. You know, for tax purposes, somebody's got to keep track of, the, track of that. So it really depends on the application. I would imagine in the retail world, I'm not a retail person, and you're looking at thousands and thousands of transactions, maybe a second, there's all kind of data there that could be used for malevolent purposes, but other people here know more about that than do I. Well, there it, is it, a consideration, it, like, sorry. I'm sorry, in healthcare, um, now we're looking at more precision medicine. So there is a problem with data um, inundation. But what we're saying is, um, what's the actionable, actionable data that you need um, and can all entities agree on that? Um, so the idea, like she was saying, is not to have like all this everything, um, but it's like, what do we need available to us to apply precision medicine to the person who's in front of us? And can we agree on that? So I would think that um, having this mass of data, um, big data as we say, um, it's a consideration but I think as we move to more, more towards precision medicine, that will alleviate itself. But if in public health or other fields, you're gonna have inference engines that are gonna take whatever data are available and create new data that nobody specifically requested, but is usable, even if it's de-identified. <coughs> you know, the amount of storage required for all this inferential data, um, do we really need it all? And no, we don't really need it all. And um, that's some of the things that are still coming along now. You know, um, uh, comprehensive um, data aggregation strategies. Um, what can we do to ensure that the data we need is there and um, what we don't need is pulled um, out. But again, it's still, uh, I, I believe it's still a debate um, how much data you need. Because, but that's one of, um, that one of the arguments I get, particularly from clinicians, often is that there's too much of it. Um, they don't need it all. You know, it takes away from precision med. And the other thing is, when you're thinking about like um, public health and public health entities, um, regulation rarely, rarely keeps up with innovation. So we have to consider that, like getting regulation changed so that we can move towards um, precision medicine and some of these blockchain uses, we're still getting that kind of pushback. Um, so they do want to collect all this data. and. Like I always say, what's your buy-in? Um, what do these entities need all this data for? I honestly think they don't know. Um, so these are the conversations that still need to be um, had, um, unfortunately. I think it's more part of the architecture. When you create a system, uh, you have different layers of data. What you put in the blockchain, it's what is important and what it matters. In the second layer, it's what you save in the nodes, which are transactions. The actual da data is stored in the clouds and it will be archived or destroyed because it's not valuable, valuable data and it's not going to be relevant uh, in the long run. So whatever is not needed will go away. I think I saw... Okay, this is uh, not just a question, this is also a comment on this gentleman's uh, previous question about the, uh, the energy used by blockchain transactions, and um, just adding on to Argentina's answer, it's not just about data that's stored, but also about the consensus method that is used to determine whose information, whose version of that ledger is the correct one. And there are several different types, the most expensive of which energy-wise is called proof of work, where individual participants need to perform actual computation work to solve puzzles using their computer to earn the right to validate transactions in the ledger. And proof of work is extremely expensive. So the question is, when it comes to 
application to energy, healthcare, and all the other fields, including uh, e-commerce. What is the approach towards the consensus algorithm, and how do you scale that with the growing population of users? For instance, uh, we created a new consensus algorithm. It's a proof of quality algorithm that it's close to a proof of stake. And uh, we did it to minimize the amount of work required to achieve consensus. So in our case, it's retail. We don't have that much valuable data. And we stick to uh, five uh, validators for each set of data. If they have a high quality, uh, I don't know, score, we measure their performance. Either they are uh, content creator, content validator, uh, notaries. Uh, we need to minimize the cost of doing business in blockchain. We cannot afford like a proof of work. I would just add something to that uh, uh, and support everything you just said that blockchain is just like anything else. Uh, it's just another tool in your toolkit. So when you're confronted with a problem, it may be you look at that and say, well, that's not a, you know, that's not a blockchain application. There's no transactions that are involved. Or, of course, if you have a client who's screaming, I want blockchain, maybe you'll give it to them. But the, the, the marketplace won't accept that. So it's the responsibility of the professional consultant advisor to say, hey, I know it's sexy, it's, it's hot, it's everything like that. It's not what you need. You'll spend three years developing this with really expensive developers from Russia and um, Israel, all these different places. You're going to wind up with a solution that you could have done in SQL or something else. So it's really the professional advisor, consultant, what have you, who shouldn't be shoving every blockchain down everybody's throat. It's not a cure for baldness and cancer or anything like that, but it does solve a heck of a lot of problems and people are gonna make a lot of money out of it. It's gonna change the world. And then in the, the, the whole purpose of um, blockchain uses in healthcare, it has one job, like I was just explaining earlier to remove um, trans transactional inefficiencies. So if it's not doing that, it's not gonna be applied. Um, so consensus becomes um, very important. Um, and the uses we're seeing now in um, the healthcare community, it does a couple of things to um, remove those um, inefficiencies. Um, transparency, most people don't know how much it costs to get treatments, drugs, and that type of thing. With the blockchain, you can create that type of um, transparency that lowers cost immediately because it would shock some of you of what some of these things actually cost as opposed to what we actually pay. pay. The other thing is it makes things available in real time. So all those um, in-between parts that we pay for would be removed. It would then lower the cost of healthcare again. Um, so the whole point of it, the uses in healthcare is to remove inefficiencies which will then lower costs. Now, you do have um, people, we were just discussing this last night, um, we know that as we have um, venture capitalists and investors coming into um, healthcare, the whole idea is to make money for shareholders. That being said, none of the uses um, we see that are going to be successful have those issues. So, well, that we feel we're gonna be successful have those issues. Um, I was gonna bring up an example for you guys. Partners Health in Boston is using um, AI um, to improve um, outcomes and um, towards precision medicine, and they're using, looking at um, blockchain models for that to um, shrink the cost of um, caring for individuals. Uh, well, I, I think I'm, I'm getting the sign. Um, and that would actually be a panel for another day, mm -hmm. talking about the, the, uh, the impact on the investment community. Uh -huh. uh, and I'm happy to leave that one too, Tian. Um, so I just want everyone to thank Sharice, Argentina, John, Desiree, and Lisa. Um, these five are, are doing really innovative things, and I urge you all to contact them, check them out in the program, uh, and thank you for your participation.